So, what I have is, uh, in fact, four possibilities which we can uh, um, play with during those three days. Um, one, uh, which would be perhaps something which links to the Biennale, uh, uh, which is more on one artist, and it's the, which is a uh, conference I, I did already I did in New York last year, uh, which is the first time in my life I wrote something polemic. Uh, it's on a German artist called Thomas de Mart. Uh, Thomas de Mart, I don't know if you... <coughs> Demand, demanding, mm -hmm. and uh, the conference was called Pictures on Demand. Um, so, but you don't seem to be familiar at all with him. Okay. Okay. He had last show at MoMA five years ago, <coughs> midlife retrospective. Um, uh, so this is, uh, uh, it's more, if you like, an easier excess because it's a polemic it's it's trying to see together with Nietzsche what is the construction of the work of art like those of Thomas de Mar, which is linked to specific historical moments in his photographic work and of constructing models that he does another one is uh, uh, called it's specifically on Roland Barthes and it's called uh, The Third Sense. Uh, it is linked to, um, in fact, Camera Lucida and to the, to the idea of the third meaning, the third in the punctum, uh, and specifically to an essay that Bach wrote uh, in the 70s, so 10 years before uh, Camera Lucida, um, and tries to bring together Roland Barthes and Walter Benjamin, the notion of reproduction uh, that Benjamin has with the notion of third meaning by Roland uh, And the third one uh, is quite dense, another one personally to start with, uh, which is specifically on Derrida or with Derrida and Jean Genet. Um, and it is about the revenant, 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 you say, no? Revenant, the revenant, the ghost. How do you? Revenant. Re re revenant, I never, can, I can never, you know, I never, re the revenant, the revenant, not reverent, the revenant, which may become some kind of revenant as well. Yeah. Uh, the revenant. And on, on uh, uh, Jean Genet. And uh, um, this is some years old already, uh, but I'm taking it out again because I'm doing a, a large exhibition on Jean Genet right now, it's preparing it, on the Bordel, the whole house, and, 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 and uh, Genet's play, which is called The Balcony. Um, this is the third, and uh, the fourth, is a, which I will show later on anyhow with uh, some images, is linked to the third meaning uh, and is linked to a show as well which was called Notation on the calculus and the form in the arts. And uh, it was in 2008 a large show which uh, uh, I did together with a friend, an artist, Dieter Abbott, in uh, uh, Berlin on the arts of notation, so inscription and scripture in all the arts of the 20th century. Um, uh, so it was linked to the third meaning and to the idea of translation, in fact, very much. Those are the, 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 the more or less for the four um, uh, papers. There's a fifth one, 
um, which is again specifically on one artist, and this is uh, Victor Bergen. I don't know if you how some say. Oh. He was here last year. He, I know, I know. I, I brought him first here once okay. years ago. We had a class together, uh, and uh, so you had him. So you had him in the class. Other class. Okay. Nobody had Victor in, in, in yet. No. Just for the evening lecture. Okay. Okay. Uh, so he was one of the artists I invited uh, years ago to Canada, and he did a work which is called Voyage to Italy. Mm. Uh, which is a, quite a fascinating uh, work between photography and film. So still a movie image. Uh, so this is a bit the range, and if we come into a great discussions, we can skip many of those things. And so this all depends on you as well, and and, and of course on your interest, because I'm here and I want to learn as much as you do. So the best is that we meet and see how, how we can speak together. Um, and perhaps like in a kind of, you can think about now what we have a, a until I, I, uh, I think we have a, in about three quarters of an hour or something, we have a break, and then I will start with one break. And meanwhile, I would like to give a kind of introduction to photography which is more free and more modern. Um, because, I mean, if you, if you have, uh, if you have read Roland Barthes, the Come on to see them, um, uh, you may wonder why Barthes wrote this book. Uh, and I have to ask, have you all read Come on to see them? Can I say, or is anyone who has not read? So if you've not, in between you have to ask questions as well. Um, so again, we can share, because otherwise you will not get it. Um, if you have read Kambalusina, you know it is a book essentially about death and time. Um, and in between death and time, there is the loss. And it is the loss of his mother, of course, of Bart's uh, 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 mother, who died in, in uh, uh, 78. And when Bart wrote this book, he wrote it very fast to reflect upon his mother. And to ref that is to reflect about loss and like he says about photography that loss is always about the partial object. So if we lose something, what we think that we have lost was already the replacement of something else. It was already a substitute. So even if we think we found what we lost, it is not what we lost that we found, what we found. So those are the three main ideas, I would say, that Bart has in uh, the Kamala Sila. And uh, which are put up on two different levels. The most familiar level we all share is the level that Roland Barthes calls the studio. The studio. Studio. Like study, but yeah. in the letter. Studio. Is the studio. And as he says, the, the studio is based on the paradigm of the cultural knowledge that we share. Depending, of course, on the culture in which we are. But this is not of any interest of, for Bart in which culture we are. As if you're more familiar with Bart, you know that in between his very uh, structural uh, linguistic uh, writings of the 60s, the photographic message and, and uh, uh, all he did about structural linguistics, as set on, on Balzac and others, 
and Kabbalah Cedar, there is the book on Japan, the Empire of Sand, which changed Bach's life completely. Because confronting a complete different culture. So, but in Kamalosida, it is not a question of culture, which culture, it's just that the studio is a reading of images, of photography, of photographs, uh, which is a reading that we can all share. We can have a consensus by this reading. Because we identify. And so it is a reading, as Bach describes the studio, which goes from the eye to the photograph. And of course you can imagine it's a reading that Bach is not at all interested in. And certainly it is not his reading of this small photograph of out of the winter garden, Jardin d'hiver, that he had, and he has been writing, he wrote the whole book of his mother. For photographs, rather, he wrote the whole book about. Um, and, which is not, of course, reproduced in the Kamal Lucidi. And if you see the book, uh, Kamal Lucidi, you see there are lots of photographs in there. <coughs> but in the first writing of the book, Bart did not want to have any photographs in there. None. And when he brought the book, the manuscript to the Gallimard and the Cahiers de Cinema, they said, Dear Roland, we can't do this. You cannot do a book about photography without photographs. And he refused. Uh, uh, and then they convinced him to, to bring photographs in there. The ones you know, some are very famous. But in the end, as you, having read it, you know, he was not really interested in, in those photographs. So the other level, uh, is the level uh, uh, which is for him the most important one, which is what he calls the punctum. Uh, so, punctum, where he says that something is pointing at me, which is more uh, Lacanian reading of photography. That is, that not only am I seeing, but by what I see, I'm seen as well. So there's a gaze put at me. I'm looked upon. And so the difference to the studium is that whereas the studium, our gaze, which is by the cultural paradigm uh, 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 gifted with power, goes onto the image. And this punto, there's a power coming out of the image tells us, but we do not know what. We cannot name it. This is the punctum. All we know is that there is a kind of vulnerability which we, us, how do you say, which we, we are, how do you say this, uh, um, which we realize or we are remarking. Uh, we are touched. Somehow we are touched. So it's a game, and we are not active, uh, but the photograph is active, or what is on the photograph. And this is the punctum. And Bart says very clearly, and there's a debate that's been going on for a long time between some people, uh, but I think he says very clearly that this punctum can only be because it's in time and out of time at the same time. It has three different levels of time. It has the time, which is the famous phrase in the Kama Lucida, uh, Saite, it has been. Hmm? Or like Laura Malve says, it was now, which is beautiful. If you imagine, it was now. I mean, if you, with this, you know, with this, it was now, you have everything with this photography. I have to write this. It was now. Even if you understand it, I write it. <laughs> it was now. So, who did you say uh, said that? This is, uh, 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 in fact, it, it, it's Laura Mulvey. Laura Marley, 
Laura, I don't have to write. It's Dante, Laura, and Malvey. Malvey. Great uh, cinema uh, historian and, and uh, theorist. One of the best, I think. Um, um, who wrote about uh, a lot of psychoanalysis and, and, and cinema. And, uh, So this is this, it was now, so the, the, it was this level, if you, if you consider, which is very difficult, three different levels of time. You have this level of time, the moment the image was taken, or the best is, if you read Talbot once, Fence of Nature, there's a photograph he took of uh, the Trinity College in Oxford, uh, in, in, in uh, Cambridge. Oxford, Cambridge, I don't know. And uh, uh, he uh, enlarges the photograph, and it's one of the photographs in the pencil of nature. They were they were glued in on paper, and then the, the printed text was beneath. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he writes, "Well, I took this photograph, but it's only by enlarging that I realized the time in which I took the photograph, because I look at the clock on the photograph." which I didn't see before. So, of course, taking the photograph, there are different times. But we don't know, because we didn't take the photograph. But there's one time at the photograph. And there's one time, uh, which is the time where we look, we look at the photograph. And then, there's a time in between. Which is the most curious time, because we do not know what is this time in between. Could be a time of expectation. Uh, could be a time of suspense. Could be a time where what is in the photograph, what was taken, has been suspended. Really in the sense of aufgehoben uh, in, in the dialectical sense that, that uh, you may know from, from, from Hegel, that, is, that it, is, it is only aufgehoben, suspended, because a decision has not been made yet, has not been drawn yet, aufgehoben. So it is still within, if you like, a critical state, this time, in between. Or you can think, like uh, the French philosopher, Jean-François Lyotard. Jean-François Lyotard. Lyotard. Once wrote about photography that it is a curious medium because it brings up a suspense without a particular expectation. You know, it's not the Hitchcock of suspense, uh, where there always is a particular expectation, under the shower or wherever, or the birds, or in the, in the ride of the car, always a particular expectation. But, according to Lyotard, photography is a suspense without a particular expectation. So this non-particular expectation is this third time between the time society was the photograph was taken and the time we look upon, there's this time in between. And then of course, and this is what we are interested in mostly, because out of this tension, out of this time without expectation, this suspense without expectation, emerges the time to become. So the time after the photograph. And the time after the photograph then is, in fact, when we look at the photograph and when we take it into a possible future. This is the essential time of becoming, which only, in fact, photography has. And this is another, this was the reason why I was from so actually fascinated, and fascinum is the right word for it, fascinated by photography, because no other medium, but perhaps music, 
This is the only one I'm not sure about. Music, perhaps. But not literature, not film, uh, not painting, has this particular suspense and this possibility that a time may emerge, which is a becoming time, out of a time which has ended. So there's one, I'll explain this, <laughs> there's one uh, phrase you will hear uh, during three days again, uh, uh, which is my definition of photography, of the paradox of the photographic image, which is that each photograph gives definitely an end to a becoming, definitely an end to becoming, but keeps the end of the be but keeps the end within the becoming. You get this? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> this is a good answer. Did, Sorry. did you say end or and? End. E N D. E N D. Okay. E N D. E N D. It's it's the end. Well, they're both. It's the <laughs> end of becoming E N D. Yeah. Finis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, a and and it's the becoming of the end. And this is so extraordinary. I mean, if you look at film, um, 24 images a second. And within, and, uh, we all know that we cannot see the singular image, 124 of a second. Uh, uh, we don't see it. By our, we can't see it. So I will, during three days, I will show you some images, photographs, by a French artist, and you don't have to write up because I'll write up later on, who was called Eric Pierre, who was in fact an actor, and uh, came to photography, but never did photographs himself. All he did was studying film, the 24 images a second, in film archives, New York, Montreal, Paris, and different. But where we need, for the 90 minutes to view the film, he needs about two days, three days, because he is looking at each singular image. And then, where he likes, he makes a photograph of this image. What is his name? Ronde de Pierre, like the round stone. Ronde de Pierre. I'll write this uh, later on, when I show the images, but we'll look tomorrow. Uh, and uh, he takes images out of the sequence and is giving another time, of course, to this image. By many reasons. I don't want to explain on the thing when I show the images. Because one image of the cinematographic film, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the, the singular image has its very essence in giving birth to the coming image. So it is within this image, of course, that the coming image originates, even though there may be a montage, so the image, next image is completely different. But it remains within a symbolic level of time, of continuity. And this was, uh, whereas in photography, of course, it's not. It's it's the guillotine, like uh, Daniela Hass was saying. It's brown. Mm. And this is the, the essential difference. So there's always the, this catastrophic element within photography. Mm. It is a catastrophe, in fact. Mm. It is coming after and giving the end mm. in, in, as a, as a uh, medium. Uh, or if you like, um, when um, very funny and strange, but uh, um, you can, if we come later on to 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 Batavinian, you will see that uh, uh, you know the, one of the essential books of Batavinian was uh, the original of the Baro uh, German Baroque drama in the twenties where he writes about the German Baroque drama, uh, of course, in the 17th century, 
uh, but he writes about allegory and symbol. And you may know the large debate for hundreds of years between allegory and symbol. The symbol being the reconciliation with nature, in very short terms now, uh, the allegory being the abstraction, the symbol. And for Benjamin, photography was purely allegoric because it was this fragmentary uh, 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 and complete disruption with continued continuum, a continuum of time and space. <coughs> it is a it's it's a discontinuous medium in fact, photography. Uh, whereas so it's allegorical, it's and furthermore it is in a certain way um, uh, uh, you may call it uh, um, desanthropomorphic. 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 Huh? So it's not anthropomorphic, it's desanthropomorphic. Desanthropomorphic. Whereas on the symbol, uh, symbolic level, film would be a, a kind of re-anthropomorphization. And film, as you all know, up to we came to the digital, uh, uh, or the electronic, let's say, uh, was made of single images. But the film itself, this is its, its essence, uh, is, is considered as being moving image. So it's only by moving the singular image that film becomes film, very simply. <coughs> so, uh, Coming back to after this slope, um, Bart, as you know, didn't give anything on cinema. He was really, the only interest he had was written in a short essay by Roland Barthes, which was called En sortant du cinéma, getting out of cinema. It's a bad translation now. En sortant du cinéma, uh, leaving cinema. I don't know if you have ever, uh, it's a great, wonderful essay. Very late, and uh, and the other link that Bach had to cinema was he describes himself in a book which was only published after his death. He didn't want it to be published before, which is called Incident, and this is his uh, journal, this is uh, journal intime, where he describes how he was going to pawn uh, cinemas in in, in Paris uh, and looking for company. This is, was his relation, and this is how he considered cinema as well, as being something that is out, that is, is filled with longing, but false longings. So when he wrote about cinema, he only wrote about the film stills, always. Like in French, film still means photocam. Uh, so you know this in, in uh, well, I don't know what you've read about. But like the third meaning when we'll talk about this later, it is the uh, photograph. He only talks about the image he can see. So it must be a, an, a, an image, an image arrêtée, a stopped image. So not all the others. There's a work by, by Victor Bergen, which is called The End. It did some 15 years ago. He has, he has some, some eight, large images <coughs> in the cinemascope format. And you see a very clear image of a photograph, and then you see slowly that there are different layers of imagery. And at a certain moment of each of those still images, you see the word, the end, coming out. And those images are done digitally out of different Im cinema images which he, he uh, uh, layered one upon the other one, to express that there is no singular image. But the only singularity by cinematographic images is the hallucinatory that we have going into cinema. But this is, this is more fun. So, <clears throat> um, And 
and time time to to, to come or becoming uh, becoming uh, uh, and if we speak about this the t- becoming time and if we speak about an end uh, this means that we consider time within a very precise and here technologically given framing which is the light it's, a, it's, it's the, the technology it's the question of the time and of course the light time so the velocity of light and the sensibility of the carrier this is how as we all know with some optical devices that photography works um, <coughs> so this means that within uh, this precise time structure there are, if you like, uh, limits are given. A frame, like a frame is a limit. Uh, there are, uh, um, uh, in a certain way, limits, frontiers, and if we work with photography, and some artistically working with photography, or others, look, if, if you take, uh, uh, take an author from literature, uh, you may know Sebald. Does Sebald? You say yes, of course you know him. Uh, Sebald? When you come wherever your home is, read Sebald. Everything he, written, everything he wrote, in, he taught in English, uh, but he, he wrote in German. He uh, left Germany in the 60s for England. And he died very young, unfortunately. But he's one of the most fabulous writers, contemporary writers. And funny enough, very early he started working with photography in his books. And uh, it's Siebert. S E B A L D. S E B A L D. And uh, any novel, uh, one certainly great, it's called Austerlitz, like uh, Agarno Austerlitz, Austerlitz, A-U-S-T-E-R-L-I-T-Z, in English as well. And he worked in photography by similar reasons. That is, that photography can be a, a, a medium of transgression. So, photography can bring us to the idea, to the thinking of transgression. Um, that is like um, uh, Roland Barthes described photography, as you may remember in La Chambre Claire, as something like, he said in French, <coughs> micro experience de la mort. La micro experience de la mort. The, so the micro experience of death. The micro. mm-hmm. the microcosmic experience of death. No, mi- no, no, uh, the, uh, uh, no, not microcosmic. Mm-hmm. Mic- no, uh, no, micro. No, 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 nothing micro. Uh, no, nothing micro. Nothing cosmic. The micro experience. So the smallest experience of death. Not micro or macro. No, not microcosmo macro, micro experience, right? <coughs> and which it is the word that he took over, in fact, by Georges Bataille. Mm. Lots of names. Bataille. Mm. I don't know. B a t a i l l e. By Georges Bataille, who in uh, in uh, his uh, book on eroticism writes about orgasm as the micro experience de la mort. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is the same notion, and Bart consciously, of course, knowing Bataille's work excellently, uh, uh, took, uh, took this over. So we will come, and this is the, the, what I'm, I'm again, uh, a large part of my, my interest, that within this medium, it brings you possibilities to consider the world in different ways. And in, of course, not only different angles, which is done by the medium itself, by, by the question 
of, uh, of perspective. Um, uh, but as well, when you consider photography as being a specific momentary constellation of time and space that photography brings together and disrupts at the same time. And now looking at you, I, I, I realize um, um, I, I have some images, but I can show you later. I, I, I mentioned the, the Lebanese artist Bani Draht before. Uh, Bani Draht, he created uh, an artist group in the 90s, which was called the Atlas Group. And in the parallel, uh, La Fondation Arabe pour l'image. Uh, he left both now, but, um, and they were a couple of artists working together in, in, uh, in, uh, in mainly in Beirut. And they worked with the archives of the Lebanese Civil War. The true archives of the photographs, mainly, thousands of photographs. They bought, uh, they got grants from Getty to buy uh, uh, photographs. They bought lots of archives. And then they made uh, narratives out of those photographs. So in fact, they, how do you say this in English now, fictionalized those archival works. Uh, so documentary for fictionalizing them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But by fictionalizing them, they authenticated them. So they made a, a, a vault that is bringing them into fiction in order to, to enhance the authenticity of those photographs which were done, for instance, from assaults, car assaults, bombs, car bombs, at precise moments uh, uh, in, in Bible. Uh, in, in the 60s and 70s. This is one way, of course. But the, the MF, bring back to the But um, uh, so those moments that, for me at least, within imagery you only have uh, um, with photography, brings you to an extraordinary range. Mainly, Within, within, if, if you work in a, in a way where you think that your own work, whatever it is you're doing, may not be important or may be very important, doesn't matter. But certainly it is by its singularity of a high relevance for the whole social and political body in which we live. And considering photography, and if you go on the flea market, and now, I don't know why it's now, but now you have tons of photographs. You go in Berlin, uh, uh, in the Straße in Juni or wherever, you have thousands of photographs. And they range from the carte de visite of the 19th century they all like you know on a on a on a like a hill, uh, not a hill, Haufen. What is a Haufen? Ein Haufen. Yeah. <laughs> How do you say? You know, a namas. Like you know, wherever you bring everything together, and then you have something pile, pile, yeah, pile, pile. And we come with um, pile. We come later to a pile. Um, uh, like uh, they piled up, or you have those uh, uh, cases, and there are hundreds of thousands of photographs torn out of albums and, and everything. Uh, so you know, if you say if we say photography is disruptive and disruption, imagine how many disruptions mm -hmm. follow the moment the photograph is taken or developed. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So all the, the the time between, as we said. Uh, a suspense without expectation is so filled with continuous disruption. So you have all the possible contradictions, uh, uh, paradoxes uh, uh, within the becoming of the end, becoming of the photograph. 
uh, which, which is absolutely extraordinary. This is why photography is so interesting if we think archives. If you read, or if you have read or read, or, or uh, um, Derrida's uh, 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 English archival fever. No? So called archival? Archival fever. Archival. Archive fever. Archive fever. Of course, there, because he's speaking about the traces, it is, it is a language, it is intimately it's linked to, to photography. At least to the idea of analog photography. So, so all those uh, 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 narratives and non-narratives. I mean, imagine that we are thinking since the 80s uh, within narratives, the notion of non-linear narratives is there, uh, uh, mostly then linked to the digital, the non-linear and the digital. But of course we know that literature for a long time has had, and since the 18th century or 17th century, lots of non-linear narratives. And certainly we know by photography that it's the, for me, it's, it's the utmost of non-linearity in the possible narratives that follow the photograph. So photography is, by definition, non-linear because it's a point. It's a point in time. There's no line to be drawn anyhow. And the difference to film. Film is on a line even though by montage it may shift um, yeah, so those are more or less the reasons why I'm so fascinated by photography. And, um, and some, funny enough, it never ceased. There's a certain love, there's a certain fascination. Absolutely, there's an eroticism <laughs> to, to, to the medium of photography, which is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly making the difference, and this is, I think, in the, in the Bartesian sense of, of you know, Bart, of, as, as, uh, he, he had a horror of style. So everything which was style, he, he, he polemized. Uh, heavily against, and specifically in photography. So once photography claimed to be art, of course it is now, but if it's claimed specifically, then Bach was not interested in it. Uh, um, uh, but if you, of course there's a difference between good photography and bad photography. But this difference, for me, is only a difference if it claims to be good, that is, if you want to print on the art market, market, if it brings up a specific aesthetic uh, argument, mm -hmm. uh, and it may succeed or not succeed, of course. But any other photograph, and be it of uh, uh, the human existence you love or you don't love, or you despise, or the children, or whatever, the tree or the, which has fallen down, or the, every photo, photograph, is a genius photograph. Always. <clears throat> so this is for me why this is the, the big, big difference. Uh, I think. Um, yeah. Should we have a break? You see this fun? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So um, uh, The paper I'm, I'm, I'll be giving is, is uh, I can email it to you, so you have it. And it was, um, um, it was a, a conference in Cambridge. Configurations of the Third it was a philosophy conference, and uh, um, uh, a 
and this was the keynote, uh, but linked specifically to Bach and, and Benjamin. Um, Did you say Bach and Benjamin? No. Yes, Bathys and Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> And Thanks, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. And I, and I have, to I have to take my glasses off to see this and on to see you. So I will always be shifted. Uh, so in, in the paper is called "Touching Sense: Roland Barthes' Third Meaning and the Tangent." Um, And when they invited for the conference, they had uh, uh, there were two pictures, and one picture was a painting of the Swedish painter Hammershoi, and it was a room, a painting with a room, and several doors, and each door seemed to be opening another door. It was a kind of Piranesi. Uh, space, infinite space. And there was a second um, uh, image which was by Escher. You probably know, most popular, the, the uh, uh, endless spheres and, and, and by, by Escher. Those were the two images. And this is why the conference was called the third, because how, how can we escape duplication? Is in the infinite something else than duplication? Okay, so there's a small epigraph, which is by Jacques Derrida, out of his book, which we call Gla. Gla is the book that uh, uh, Derrida wrote in the 70s on Jean Genet. I don't know if you're familiar, if you're not familiar with it, you, you will become familiar with this book, because we'll have another uh, talk about it. So I'm not explaining, but it's a book about family and reproduction uh, uh, and Jean Genet, who was homosexual. And the whole book is one of the most extraordinary books that Jacques Derrida wrote. Uh, it's like a brick, thick thing, and everything is written in two columns. One is on Genet and one is on Hegel and Hegel's idea of family. And when he brings Genet to Hegel, he opens windows in the column on Hegel. And when he brings Hegel to Genet, he opens windows in the column of Genet. It's an extraordinary book. Unfortunately, when they made a small edition, folio edition, they forgot the columns. <laughs> so the whole didn't work anymore. But it's, if you have any chance, it's, it's, it's a brilliant translation to English and, and a fairly good one which came out two years ago. In, in okay. So, and the quotation by Derrida reads, I am already dead signifies that I am behind. I am already dead signifies that I am behind. So let me start by alluding to two images. A painting by the Swedish, a uh, Danish, not Swedish, Danish painter Wilhelm Hammershoi, I just mentioned, called Open Doors, and a drawing by Escher with three spheres. While two doors, Hammershoi, or three spheres, Escher, established a relation by juxtaposition set off against one another, forming a sort of ideographic pair of respective interpretations, the third is not complementary to the two, but figures as an intrusion and opens a configuration. Evidently, we all have the tendency to appropriate the third by opening the triadic structure of symbiosis. So, 
so soon with the triadic structures of symiosis, symiosis, rather than dismantle this triadic structure of signification by some unnamed third, some outsider, some alterity, someone or something that is not recognized by signification, that may or may not have a presence. This unnamed third escapes appropriation. It can neither be added nor subtracted to any field of being. It is allegorical without a nomenclature. You know, the traditionally allegories had specific nomenclature. From when you went in, in the, the uh, um, icono iconologies, you had it up to the 18th, early 19th century in order to be able to explain the paintings. Mm -hmm. So you went through the Louvre uh, with the books, the iconologies, in order to uh, uh, explain the, the symbols or the allegories in the paintings. So there was a specific use of allegories, of course, in the painting. But here, so, the third being allegorical without a nomenclature. The third emanates as it disappears in the process of transformation, or more probably, perhaps, in the process of translation. It is here that Walter Benjamin and Roland Barthes may meet and what had been technical reproduction for Benjamin may very well be associated with what Roland Barthes called the troisième sens, so the third sense. And the third sense, I say sense in, in the, uh, the small article that Barthes published in the seventies, was called the troisième sens, and Stephen Heath translated it into English, and I think in a very problematic way, because he translated it by saying the third meaning. But the third, the troisième sens, the sens is not a meaning. Ce n'est pas une signification. So this is a very important, so this is why it's called the third sense and not the third meaning. Uh, what Bach called the troisième sens, or later in his last book published shortly before his death, La Chambre Claire ou Carolus Cedar, the punctum. So troisième sens and punctum are on one Both, if I may say so, so Benjamin and Bach met through photography and its unique allegorical shape. Both were not interested in the photographic images, the style, the studio, but in the intricate relation into which the gaze enters when revealing otherness in the photograph. It is a very intimate space that opens with photography. Not a space of gain, but a space of loss, of melancholy as Freud put it. A loss profoundly felt, <coughs> a loss profoundly felt without being able to be named. You know, this is the dif difference that, uh, that Freud makes in his essay on melancholy between mourning and melancholy. Mourning is the loss of an object which is identified, by, so you can name the loss whereas melancholy is the loss of an object that you cannot name. <coughs> Before getting closer to this relation, and by taking a deviation, I would like to show you an image you may be familiar with. It has become an enigmatic picture for the second half of the 20th century. In German, der Fleck auf dem Spiegel, der den Atemhaut schafft. <coughs> A photograph 
which the German artist Dieter Appelt took in the year 1979. 1979. <coughs> Translated to English, the title reads, The Stain That the Breath Produces on the Mirror. A sentence taking, taken from Raymond Roussel's book, Nouvelles Impressions d'Afrique. <coughs> so, Raymond Roussel, um, talk a little about him, uh, a writer praised by the Surrealist in, in the 20s and 30s. Um, uh, who suicided in 35. Incredible masterpieces both. So, this photograph in the book. In 1966, Michel Foucault wrote, quote, With Roussel, language reduced to powder in a systematically driven randomness tells infinitely the repetition of death and the secret of doubled and duplicated origins." End of quote. In 1928, Raymond Roussel published Les Nouvelles Impressions d'Afrique, a book written in Alexandrin, so verses, which he took seven years, as he says, to write, and which he also survived by seven years till he committed suicide in 1945. And it's probably a strange irony that exactly in 1935, René Magritte painted this extraordinary painting, which you may have seen if I describe it, of somebody, a man before a mirror. And what you see in the mirror reflection is not his face, but his back. And the painting is called in French, la reproduction interdite, the forbidden reproduction. I may have it in the kitchen show. On a on a trivial note, I, I have the, the Spanish translation of Camera Lucida, and that's the the image on the front cover. No. Yeah. Which is completely nuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yeah. See, they do every, any, you know, this is why probably Bach said, I don't want any images. <laughs> it is impossible to say what this book, so uh, Raymond Roussel's Nouvelles Impressions d'Afrique, 500 pages, big book, it is impossible to say what this book is about. But the attempt to create a third meaning, a sense that results from reproduction, the impression, impression that escapes signification, being neither the reproduction nor what is reproduced, but the alterity in between both. <coughs> the book is about, if I may say so, two glass plate photographs. One of the bazaars of Cairo, one of Luxor, encapsulated in a minuscule glass tubes, put to the eye like a lorgnette, two millimeters thick. So Roussel describes this very precisely. And to give you an idea, This is very out of focus. No, that's okay. It's not a good point. This is a photograph of the, uh, in fact, it is Luxor. Uh, it's Cairo. It's the market in Cairo in around 1860. And you have a mummy uh, dealer, not a uh, senior dealer, but Lil. Because deal and Lil, and this is a good point. Uh, uh, it's a mummy dealer, uh, and it's a very, you know, we could st stay um, with this photograph for a long time now. It's a very strange photograph, absolutely strange. You know, they, they sold mummies uh, as an aphrodisiacum, 
uh, in the 19th century. Uh, so, um, so the book Impression d'Afrique departs from two small glass tubes, very small, with two photographs in them. Uh, and if I have not says, said so before. Those small photographs, each tube one photograph, they are mirrored within thousands of mirrors in this small glass tube. It's like if you have a large today, uh, what is called K2 or whatever, digital beamer, you have those thousands of small mirrors which move all the time. I don't know if you've ever entered a beamer, it's very interesting to see how the technology functions. So it's, it's odd. Bima is made out of hundreds of thousands of minuscule mirrors. So a mirror is a projection, of course. So, so Remo Roussel describes those two photographs, and Foucault, in 1963, writes in his really extraordinary book on Remo Roussel, Roussel had placed in front of our eyes, readers, a glass of which the lens would have been grey. <coughs> All signifying structures are brought to a threshold where the mirror anticipates by forwarding the things it reflects through constant tropological deviations. It's like in a, in a baroque mirror, so you do not know where the reflection originates. So its tropological deviation means that it is constantly, by the shifting of your perspective, it shifts its own origin. What has been there will be in a perpetual reversement, a reverberation eluding the original, or more precisely, taking the reproduced towards the possible original. That, incorporated into the reproduction, maintains the infinite differences, difference which may be the third sense. So again, you have to imagine those tubes are, everything which is in there is about reproduction. Already in his poem, La Vue, Raymond Roussel wrote, I quote, La vue est une très fine photographie, imperceptible sans doute. The gaze, Roussel wrote, is a very fine photograph, unperceivable, doubtless. So we are looking into those tubes and we are looking through those tubes at two different photographs. The thin glass tubes produce an effect of mirroring, an Escher effect, a mise en abîme, a telescopage. Are you familiar with the, the term mise en abîme? Mm -hmm. Some are, some not. Mm -hmm. uh, mise en abîme is it's, the term itself comes out of uh, the of a heraldic tradition, but it's mainly used within cinema language. Uh, uh, so, it translated literally, mise en abîme means put into an abyss. Put into an abyss. And uh, it means the reduplication of its own structure within an image. To give you the example I like most is if you've ever seen uh, Wim Wenders' Paris, Texas. <laughs> and there's a certain moment when, um, uh, where, 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 anyway, the father and son, they drive, he drives on a, on a pickup in LA in one of those extraordinary highway slopes, which is an allegory already of, of cinema. Uh, and uh, the sun is 
sitting on the back of the pickup. The son is looking back, and father, of course, driving, looking forward. And the son is eating cheese. And the cheese is the cheese la vache qui rit. <laughs> and la vache qui rit, some of you may know as well, it's very, in America it's, very, it's the only really uh, lots of sold uh, French cheese. It's really the worst one you can get, but it's sold enormously. On, on the, on the uh, picture, you have a, a, a smiling uh, cow, la vache qui rit. And the cow has an amulet around the neck. And on the amulet is a cow smiling with an amulet around the world. So this is the Nizanabi, the reduplication. This is what Nizanabi means. And another word for this kind of Nizanabi exists, uh, was brought up by, by Jacques Lacan, uh, uh, referring to the mise en abîme of signifying structures, of the signifier and the signified. And where uh, Lacan speaks about Joyce, uh, about Finnegan's Wake, where the, uh, 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 as you, if, if you've read or looked into it, uh, uh, Joyce always works with, uh, with neologism on the one hand, uh, but he works with phonetic uh, 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 scripture uh, and specific layering of signified and signified. And uh, Lacan brought up this wonderful word for this, telescopage. No, the telescopage. Uh, telescopage is on one hand is the telescope, uh, the Galilei telescope. So you, 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 uh, you have and then you you, you, what do you, call this? Extend. you extend and you bring it in again. This, this is called the telescopage. But on the other hand, in the 19th century, when you had the first train crashes, they were called telescopage as well, because when the train crashed, the, 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 the wagons, they crashed into each other like a telescope. Like this. And, and for Lacan, the way Joyce wrote and, and problemized signify and signify was a stiloscopage, where the signified and the signified crashed. So and this is a bit with Rousset as well. So and, and it, 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 it is linked to the mise en abîme. So the thin glass tubes produce an effect of mirroring, an Asher effect, a mise en abîme, a telescopage, where each tiny square of time is reflected upon the other, creating endless palimpsest surfaces. It is like an echo that retains the complete chain of signifiers but spreads them all over, like in a grammato grammatological cataclysm. Can you please repeat that one? It is like an echo. It's okay. For me, it's okay. It's very dark. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's a lot. later on I come to this image, then we can go to it. Yeah. It is like an echo that retains the complete chain of signifiers, but spreads them all over, like in a grammatological cataclysm. You know, uh, Now, one, one could extend this now, because the, the echo, uh, <coughs> for me, is a fundamental figure of photography. <coughs> but it's the echo, the Ovidian echo, the nymph. <coughs> and I don't know if I should... Uh, um, no, we, can, we come back later on to this echo. After we can keep it in hand uh, to, uh, to, to uh, if, if, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, the book uh, Metamorphosis by Bovin, where the, the myth of Echo and Narcissus and they meet and the love and dis the, the disillusion of love uh, and, and desire between word and image, between sound and image, 
this is what for the wheat and, and the narcissism echo uh, are about. And it's the most extraordinary. Uh, but it's too much, too long to tell you now. So I would like to be, come back later. But from the 18th century on, you know those echo parks, which, which, uh, which originated in, in England, uh, in the English garden. And uh, the largest park, which is still today outside of Echo Park, which was constructed outside of London, is a park where the, e the echo brought back 17 syllables. 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 17 syllables. <laughs> <laughs> 17 syllables. Uh, which is extraordinary. You imagine the phrase you have to say in order to have 17 syllables. It's, it's very long. And, uh, um, uh, and of course, it gives us the idea, and we always have the idea, and this is uh, something uh, that the echo could somehow give an answer to our questions. This is our dream, mm -hmm. that the echo would answer our concerns and questions. But of course the echo cannot answer. Mm -hmm. And this is one uh, 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 end. Of course the echo as well uh, is but what is repeated. So it or originates always in the other, the echo. This is what the nymph echo was condemned to by Juno. But this I don't know, this is the story, but this is the story later. And the grammatological cataclysm is uh, so grammatological of, of all the signs, mm -hmm. that all signs come together beyond a signifying structure. And there's a, there's a, I make a bracket, uh, there's a wonderful story in the 19th century, in the 60s, in Boston, where a photographer went, uh, who was um, uh, making death photography in the hospital of Boston, where it was very known, the best way to earn money. And he always went in the morning to the hospital to make photographs of dead people who just had died. And he met always somebody on, on the way to the hospital who had a very high front, uh, big head, and looked very interesting and said, well, I don't dare to speak, I would love to make a photograph of him. Uh, but he didn't. And one day he was called to hospital uh, to make another death photograph, and who was lying there? This guy, dead. But they did not know why he died. And it turned out that he was a scientist. And it turned out further that he was a linguist. It's a true story. I mean, you could read the story in the journal, uh, in, in, in the Bulletin uh, of And uh, so they tried to, uh, uh, to see why he died. Then they came to the idea he wasn't intellectual, so his heart was at the head. So they took out the brain of this man. And they looked at the brain, but it looked fine. And then the photographer, about 100 and about 100 years, 100 and some years before Antonioni's blow up, said, well, could, you, could I have this brain? And I'll bring it back to you, but I have to make some slices. And he took it back to his laboratory photography. Then he made slices of the brain and he enlarged it. He, he used the brain as a negative and enlarged the brain slices. And what did he discover? All kinds of linguistic signs. Demotic signs, hieroglyphs, rune alphabetic signs, and so on, so Arabic signs. And, but they came, were all together. So there was a complete disorder. And in fact, the grammatological practice <coughs> as well where everything came, there was no signifying structure anymore within the sounds. So this is why then the, the photographer said, well, he died um, of a Babylonic disorder of languages. <laughs> this was the great <coughs> allegory of photography. 
So, back. Even while Raymond Roussel, with a meticulous order, is breaking into this atomized structure of dispelled fragments within those tubes, the photographs themselves have already ruined the representation, representation and ruined already any attempt at resurrection, extinguishing the referent that reflect the light of the becoming image. Photography is the singular medium, this is the phrase, that puts an end to the becoming while maintaining or suspending the becoming of the end. Roussel, in all his books, is faced with what Foucault calls the anxiety of the signifier, meeting the misery and the celebration of the signifier facing either too many signs or not enough signs. Now in the work of Appelt, the impression one, so this work, perhaps we could um, just briefly. Now in the work of Dieter Appelt, the impression one receives is an impression of death. Masked with marbled powder, the mirror reflects Appelt, so it's a self portrait in an act of self-confirmation. Breathing onto the mirror is, in fact, an act of momentary presence. The stain left by the breath is like the stain left by an ejaculation. The mirror reflection reproduces the stain, dividing by doubling the singularity of the breath before it disappears. It is a touching, an encounter, a touché, as Lacan would say, a point without a line. You see it very clearly, the, the image? So if, you, if one would go further into this image now, into this photograph, you will see that, I mean, the first thing you may ask is where is before and where is behind the mirror? <coughs> and what indicates that one part of up is before and the other part is behind the mirror? What is the reflection and what is the reflected effect? But you will see that in the construction of the image, there's, there's a kind of uh, axe, moving axe, uh, axe, uh, how do you call axis. this? Axis, which goes more or less from the hand up to this strange <coughs> thing behind the head, which affects a, a lamp. And around this axe, it's like if the image would turn. Roland Barthes, so a point without a line. Roland Barthes, in his book on Japan, wrote about the point without a line, the haiku, in fact. A child taking a photograph without putting a film into the camera. In the work of Sai Twombly, Barthes traces the satori, the complete interruption of causal logic as having suddenly emerged by some tiny, quote Bach, even ridiculous, aberrant, aberrant, preposterous circumstance, the subject wakens to radical negativity. The subject wakens to radical negativity, which is no longer a negative negation, but uh, as this wakening which is neither epiphanious, nor surrealistic, nor cathartic, is taken up again in numerous of his writings on the image, from the rhetoric of the image in 1964 
to the Kamal Lucida in 1979. While in the rhetoric of the image, Bart calls this third message of a photograph. So if you have not read it in, in the rhetoric of the image, uh, you have the iconic message, uh, which is uh, coded, and you have the linguistic message. So both message, such messages on an information level, it's the um, uh, linguistic, and on the iconic, the image, they are both coded. But he speaks already there of a third message of a photograph, and says this is the iconic message without code. In his 1970 essay on some of Eisenstein's film stills entitled The Third Meaning, Bach develops what he calls the obtuse meaning. The obtuse meaning. The meaning beyond signification. A meaning that is neither on the informational nor the symbolic level. The third meaning, the obtuse meaning, is not situated structurally. The obtuse meaning is a signifier without a signifier. Whence the difficulty is naming it. Uh, whence, difficult, whence the difficulty in naming it. My reading remains suspended between the image and its description, between definition and approximation. If we cannot describe the obtuse meaning, this is because, unlike the other one, the obvious meaning, it copies nothing. But how describe what represents nothing? The third meaning cannot be grasped by any meta-language, such as criticism. It is discontinuous. No exchange is possible, no economic exchange. The obtuse meaning man maintains a permanent state of depletion. It is in the Camera Lucida that Bart develops this, his theory of the studium and the punctum, leaving completely behind his own linguistics, structural linguistics, and semiology, in favoring psychoanalysis, so for the order of the imaginary. The punctum, this small mark we put into writing as to indicate the end of the phrase. This is one of 57 definitions that the litre is up for punctum. Of a, for punctum. The punctuation pictures the rhythmic and musical notation of the reading sense and of the reading's sense. So it's doubled sense. This is why the translation of meaning, uh, the third meaning, the troisième sens, is so uh, uh, false. We apprehend the temporality beyond the grammatical tense of the phrase. In terms of space, the point, the punctum, claims a point of view from the reader, or the view. Paul Klee, you know, the, the uh, uh, German painter, Paul Klee, and teacher at Paul's And Paul Klee was uh, as well the painter that Benjamin favored most. And the painting by, by uh, Paul Klee, Anglus Novus, was the origin for his philosophy history, his thesis on the philosophy history. Paul Klee, in his grammar of elements and form, uh, written in 1928, Uh, so, 
some years, about uh, 15 years in fact, after Kandinsky, uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, 20th century, Kandinsky wrote this book on the point of the line as the origins of painting. Uh, and Benjamin's task of the translator, we'll come to this later, uh, was just written two years before uh, Paul Klee wrote this grammar of elements of folk. So Paul Klee writes, I quote Klee, about the question of what is the point? So not what is the point, but what is the point? The point is not without dimensions, Klee says. It is an element of surface infinitely small, which as an agent executes the zero movement. So this is extraordinary. So the, the point in Clay's thinking is a point of zero. It's not a point which is inert or of inertia, but it's a point of zero movement. So there is movement, but there's no zero movement that executes the zero movement. That is to say, it resumes itself in its existence. As soon as the pencil touches the paper for more, the line appears and the point disappears. The point, Clay goes further, is cosmical. It is a basic element. All Clay wrote, I don't, I, up to today I haven't really understood this, all sperm is of cosmic nature. The point is cosmical because it is situated at the intersection of different directions. The line results from the ideal tension between two points. Result, the arcade. The point is brought into movement and gives birth to a constitutive, constitutive figure emerging from construction. Sorry, could you rewind a little bit? Uh, it's situated at what? The, the, the line, so the line, the line results from the ideal tension between two points. And then he says, so this ideal tension, he says, result, two points, the arcade which is very surprising. And, and then he explains what he means by the arcade. And the arcade for him is, the point is brought into movement and gives birth to a constitutive, constitutive figure emerging from construction. So the constitutive figure is the line between the two points, which is an arcade. And we come back to this, and well, we can go to many many discussions as well, because this is a very strange uh, uh, remark. Because this may allude, in fact, to the task of the translator that Benjamin had published only two years previously. And I, remi I remind the sentence that Walter Benjamin brought in this task of the translator, which says, for if the sentence is the wall before the original language, the word for word is the arcade. For if the sentence is the word that is the wall before the original language, the word for word is the arcade. Benny makes this remark in relation to what kind of translation? And we'll come to this later. So, sense originates and ends with the point. The point encloses the gesture of giving and of a forecoming closure. Louis Marin remarks that the point, though it may be seen as the most banal and ordinary accident of the act of reading may also be considered as the breathing of the text. The point considered as the breathing of the text. And you may see another breathing here without it. As Marin says, the point is the minuscule 
an imperial index of the black. It remarks the neutral. It neutralizes the secret voice of the I. I. This I. It remarks the neutral. It neutralizes the secret voice of the I. End quote. The point marks the instant as an inevitable but sense taking presence. By marking the space between the signifiers, we are pointed at by something, by a movement yet to be taken, in arcade, so the figure, as Clay says, between two points, by a movement yet to be taken, in arcade, as Clay wrote, and as Benjamin had developed, or as Bart thought, in what, uh, or thought, in what he called, in inverted book, a book which that would report a thousand incidents by not permitting one single line of sense. Thousand incidents by not permitting one single line of sense. So it's the same. It's, it's like those tubes with, with Roussel, in fact. There is not a line of sense. And it's the same with all what we consider with the fragmentary. And it's the same what we consider with the point where we come to. So the inverted book, a book that would report a thousand incidents by not permitting one single line of sense. And you may be, you know, may know that uh, 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 Flaubert. Uh, there were two figures mainly in the 19th century. One was Flaubert on the arranged book and nothingness. And Flaubert says, you know, was his dream to write about a book about nothing. But this nothing might not be named as nothing. So his dream was to write a book without any narrative. And on the other hand, you had at a little later than Flaubert, uh, but coming partly out of Flaubert as well, Malarmé, Le Livre, Malarmé, does this sound? Shall I write it? Malarmé, M-A-L-R-A-R-M-P? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, Malarmé, when, when uh, his idea of the book was linked to the nothingness, but from the other hand, from the other, from another dimension, because his book was supposed to be infinite. So, uh, with millions of possible possibilities, since it was a book to be read in, like, in a mise en scène, not mise en abîme, it was the same, but in a mise en scène, jointly, like staging the book. Um, so, inverted book. So the point may be linked to the idea of an inverted book. The point may also be understood as an allegory of a delayed moment. Difference, if you like. For Roland Barthes, the point originates certainly in the visual space and also certainly in the acoustic space in the sense that Roland Barthes gave to the Eisensteinian postulate that film, that film had to be studied ear and eye alike. And the sense that La Chambre Claire in, this, in the original title in French, it says La Chambre Claire and says une, no, it says only la chanteur and not sur la photographie. Of course, in the English translation, it's, 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 uh, they took it away, as far as I know. It's a quote, in a note on, uh, I don't know what it's no, called. No, it's camera scene. Sorry? It's only camera scene. Isn't there a subtitle? Yeah. No subtitle? English, 
and in German they made it wrong as well. So, and of course, in, in the original, uh, not Surah Photography has the two significations, like a notice, uh, and it, it's, it's of course the musical note. And when he says, when he refers to Eisenstein, um, uh, uh, film has to be studied uh, uh, ear and eye alike. Uh, he refers to the Einsteinian dialectic of, of montage. So, of, of uh, and you know, when, when Einstein uh, entered the debate of some movie uh, in the 20s, and uh, he said, Well, if we have sound for the movie, the sound has to go against the image and never with the image. The sound has to destroy, to disillusion the illusion of the image and not emphasize it, announce it. And this was, of course, this great Einsteinian philosophy of film and montage, which uh, uh, became lost somehow. So, um, so but anyway, so the poetry would be within visual and acoustic space. And I have to see, I mean, the other question, really important, I don't know if any of you are within music. No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, because there it's, it's, it's really a, a big question, and we may come in the discussion to this. Punctum and music, uh, I think very important. Um, the punctum. that, according to Bart, meets, touches, and wounds the spectator exclusively in the photograph or in the film still, is the third sense, is by definition, by its very delirious constitution, not discursive. So the punctum is not discursive. So, but, you know, if you think, the arcade, figure of translation of Benjamin, the arcade, the figure of construction from point to point, point by constitutive figure is clear says for painting. And, but consider this point, now with Bart, to be by very definition not discursive. Um, it is, so the point, is imaginable only within the indexical structure of the very hallucinatory instantaneousness and immediacy of the photographic image. The difference between studium and punctum arises not from my study of the image, but rather from my being studied, marked, punctuated by the image. By the mark of something, Bart writes, the photograph is no, no longer, is suddenly, sorry, I repeat, by the mark of something, Bart writes, the photograph suddenly is no longer anything whatever. This something, he continues, has triggered, has provoked a tiny hook, a satori, the passage of the void, what cannot be transformed nor even repeated under the instances of the insistence, of the insistent gaze. The punctum, uh, and of course, the punctum marks the past of the becoming. Here we go into the time. The punctum marks the past of the becoming. It is, as one would say, a chronos apocalypsis, the inscription of the past in the future perfect. The photograph, Bart writes, referring to Lacan is the absolute particular, the sovereign contingency, mat 
and somehow stupid, the this you tell, in a short, what Lacan calls the tufé. So, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, in, in Lacan's seminar on, on, uh, on the tableau, Lacan speaks about uh, the tufé as being the, the random encounter and uh, on, on the symbolic level. Thuré is the encounter of the, with the real, but completely randomness. And Thuré is the figure of randomness. Um, the book, John, very often, as Bart knows, and he writes a small chapter about this, uh, uh, is a partial object, as we when I said before, so linked to to, uh, to a loss, to be reconstituted, which is impossible. Now all this leads to psychoanalysis. And being myself absolutely opposed to the use of psychoanalysis, and metaphorically, and not metonymically, not having had a self-analysis, myself. And so being incapable of what Freud claims to have an uncritical self-observation, an uncritical self-observation. Uh, so I'm reading Freud like any other text. And doing this, of course, I have a serious problem. And I will always maintain this problem. On the other hand, I know how extraordinarily important psychoanalysis is. So it's a real existential problem I, 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 I uh, am outing. Because, you know, some people, uh, they continuously do their self-analysis and work with psychoanalysis. Uh, uh, many of the good psychoanalytical critics, they do and have this. I haven't done this step ever. I probably will not do this step any time. And they continuously do this step. So I'm working with Freud uh, on another level of things. So it, it remains somehow metaphorical. Which is a, it's a, it is a huge problem, I must say. We can uh, come into this. Nevertheless, it is so beyond the compulsion to compose in the term of Freud, in terms of Freud, in the drive to translate the term of Freud, the trip zur Übertragung, that the third, third sense resides. So I refer to Jean Laplanche, who brilliantly wrote about the wall and the arcade, about Benjamin's essay on, on uh, the task of the translator. And I would like to remind you of you, uh, the, one of the central phrases in Benjamin's essay, 1926, on, on the task of the translator, is, I quote, translation doesn't envisage, 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 itself, so translation doesn't envisage itself like poetry as plunged, so to speak, in the forest of language, in the forest of language, but outside it. Translation is outside the forest of language. Opposite the forest without entering it. Translation calls and penetrates the original in this unique place where, <coughs> come again, the echo in its own language can resonate with a work in a foreign language. It's a very complicated structure that uh, Benjamin proposes there. And it's even more complicated when I say this in English 
why he says this so brilliant intro. <laughs> uh, well, this is the official translation of Mitchell Wiener to English, but uh, that Laplace uses as well. But it's very difficult. But what is to, to keep is, so Benjamin conceives like the, 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 the forest hmm, of significations within a language, let's say in a poem, so poetry, and considers the translation to come from the outside. And as he says very clearly, without entering. So what he is looking for, in fact, is this arcade, so this constitutive figure that brings the point from the outside to the point of the inside. But then, if you translate this into an architectonic structure, you ask, okay, what kind of constitution of space is this? And this becomes very important. Uh, so, did you get, uh, shall I read again this phrase, or is it okay? okay? Yeah? Okay. Translation doesn't envisage itself like poetry as plunged, so to speak, in the forest of language, but outside it. Opposite the forest, without entering it. It calls and penetrates the original in this unique place where the echo in its own language can resonate with a work in a foreign language. So, of course, with the echo, he brings something, he adds something. Because the echo comes up suddenly with an own or her own language. So we may come, we keep this in mind, because it's not in the text, but we have to come back to this. Because there we have echo and narcissus, which become very important. So, end of quote, what I mean. Um, although, well, I uh, just mentioned, although psychoanalysis never admitted, echo being inseparable from Narcissus, the nymph into the, in the Ovidian myth, having been mutilated to a relation to the other, this is echo, she has a relation to the other, with a rap, without a relation to the self. This is echo. Never admitted so psychoanalysis if you if you read a little in psychoanalysis you will you will realize that in, since Freud uh, you always have the figure of Narcissus. You never have the figure of echo. echo. She doesn't appear. Very, very strange. The, the only one who, who, who brought her up once was Derrida. Uh, even with Lacan, uh, Echo is inexistent. It's aston astonishing enough. So, and, and in the myth, I will tell you a more about the myth later. But this, for here, you have to know in the myth, Echo, so uh, being mutilated not to speak, but only to repeat the words of the other. She has no relation to the self, but only relation to the other. Whereas Narcissus, looking in the pond, has only a relation to the self, without a relation to the other. And those are allegorical of the two figures that we brought together in the middle. So the, the, the two different relationships, which are, as we know, essential and constitutive for, for, for the social being, or for being. Um, so one would have to, and I'm not doing it here, but we can do this together, one would have to think exactly why does Benjamin bring up echo here? And I think it would be, nobody has asked this, and I think it would be very interesting to do so. So, the third, however, the punctum is the touching of the tree. 
so within the forest of language. The third is the touching of the tree. Or as Jean Laplanche says, in commenting uh, 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 Benjamin, we do not enter the forest the too familiar use of the language, of our own language. We also, he adds, don't press our nose up to one single tree, such as the lover of reality in Plato. Here we are then at the edge of the forest, where every tree detaches itself to try to cause a resonance from tree to tree of something that echoes the original. You know, like the mirrors and the tubes, so you, you see the, um, uh, the, the this, this link. Um, and this exactly, and of course, uh, this exactly is to be linked to the necessary movement within the act of translation, touching the trees in order to discover the spatial organization of the text. Benjamin, in a famous passage in the task of the translator, the task of the translator says that translation no. Oh yeah, here he calls. He was saying, "No, I never said this." <laughs> Sorry. Benjamin, in a famous passage, says that translation is not determined by the text in an absolute parallelism, but in the way that a tangent has its course determined by the point of tangency. So this is the essential. But by the way, the by the way that a tangent has its course determined by the point of tangency. Could you read all that again, please? Uh, I can read, I can tell you, it's from the Lysian, but, yeah. uh, in, in, uh, so in the passage of his text, Benjamin says that uh, the, the translation is not determined by a parallelism between the, the text to be translated and the translation. There's no parallelism, at least in the philosophy of translation that he forms, but in the way that a tangent has its course determined by the point of tangency. That means that the translation depends on this touching. So this point of touching, this punctum, which marks, in fact, will be marked, the, the volume, the space of language, the trees, the forest, as it marks the translation and where the translation goes. So as we all know, from geometry, in the school at least. The tangent touches and goes off. So, and with Laplanche, we can define this movement as a movement that does not want to be self-enclosed and reduce the other, be it the other text, to the terms of that self, but rather to be a movement towards the other. The tangential point of touching the circle is not an appropriating gesture, but could be conceived as a disappropriating term. In photographic terms, in fact, disanthropomorphic, situated within this loss of self. And as awkward it may sound, but this is exactly the movement entailed in technical reproduction. Shall I make a break here? It's a bit heavy, no? Mm -hmm.